presentation of today, uh, I'm going to call up in a minute uh, a, a good friend of the Regenerative Medicine Foundation. And I would call him one of the great pioneers of stem cells in regenerative medicine. And of course, that's Dr. Mike West. Um, Mike, uh, you know, is one of these iconic guys. If you, one of the first books I read when I became an advocate was a book called Merchants of Immortality. And sure enough, Mike was uh, described with his work at Geron, founded Geron, Advanced Cell Technology, and now Biotime, that is doing pathfinding work. One of the challenges we have as gerontologists has always been, and maybe it's starting to change a bit, a difficulty of perceiving that we can ever understand and intervene in such a profound problem uh, of aging. But it shouldn't come as a surprise that, like all of biology, there are clockwork mechanisms at work in aging. Any of you who go, remember the old carnivals, you go and you, people can guess your age, and if they're wrong, you know, you win money. We age on cue. And so many age-related degenerative diseases are an inevitable process of aging itself. And so nature is giving us clues as to what is behind this biology. And we need to pay attention to those clues. I'm reminded just now of, of uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment. And, and uh, Albert Einstein recognized nature is telling us something here. And it, led to the, you know, the theory of relativity. Well, if we don't look and pay attention to those lessons of nature and just look at aging very simplistically, we could say, well, it's like entropy. Things go toward disorder. So a complex biological machine like a human, it's very easy to imagine that we just fall apart. After all, that's a law of nature. It's the second law of thermodynamics. Things tend to go from ordered state to a disordered state. In fact, maybe it's not so much a question of why we age, but maybe it's more of a question of why do we live as long as we do, given all the damage and wear and tear that we experience during a lifetime. You can think, for instance, of the free radical theory of aging. Many of you have heard about, you know, take antioxidants because they fight free radicals that rust the body the way a car rusts as it gets older. Well, I would argue that nature is telling us something very different. And so my challenge is to try to communicate what where modern gerontology is at. Here is an experiment not done by humans, but done by nature itself. So on the left, we see Werner syndrome. This is a premature aging disease uh, that causes many manifestations of age in the 30s or 40s. And on the right, you see Hutchinson-Guilford syndrome, which is a premature aging disease. You've probably seen these children on television. It's really tragic. I mean, they have, if you look at this uh, young boy here, graying of hair, you know, around the age of 10 or 12, profound loss of hair or alopecia. If you look closely, you can see liver spots on his skin, the age pigment, wrinkled skin, osteoporosis, cataracts, heart disease, coronary disease. They generally die of a heart attack in their teens. But it's not because of type A personality. It's not because of lack of exercise. It's not because of a high cholesterol diet. Indeed, they have normal lipoproteins in their blood. Both of these diseases, of course, because of modern you know, genomic technologies, are completely understood now on a molecular level. We know exactly the genes that are involved in this. And I would argue that they have essentially nothing to do with entropy and wear and tear. Another lesson that nature is giving us about aging can be seen in the life cycle. So what we see is a constant succession of similar individuals, but the individuals themselves passing away. And hidden within this picture 
is a profound message. I, I don't even have words to express how profound this is, but I'll try to walk you through the science behind it right now. So in the 1800s, with Schleiden and Schwann's cell therapy, uh, cell theory, scientists recognized that the human body is composed of cells. And then in the mid-1800s with Darwin, there came together this grand synthesis. And the idea was life began with single cell organisms that didn't age or didn't have to age. And instead, they just replicated indefinitely. And so they were called immortal. It didn't mean that they couldn't die. It meant that they didn't have to die. They could continue an uninterrupted proliferation. And then in a sort of debate between Darwin and a German naturalist, August Weismann, Weismann, a brilliant naturalist, really, saw that the, here we had in, with, embedded within the cell theory and the discovery that there is a human mammalian egg cell, that there is a mechanism that could explain heredity. So Darwin's rather contorted ideas were wrong. And Weismann proposed, as I'm showing here, that there's a lineage of cells at the top that continue to replicate just like that original uh, single-celled organism that we came from. And then some point early in evolution, the cells clung together in multi, a simple multicellular organism like Volvox that I'm showing you here. And that for the first time in the history of evolution, we had the evolution of programmed aging and death. And so somatic cells, cells that branched off from that immortal lineage, uh, made sort of a soma. And the somatic cells, Weissman predicted in around 1881 in an essay called The Duration of Life, he predicted that somatic cells had a finite capacity to divide. And so aging of humans and mammals was caused by uh, a, a limited capacity of the human body to regenerate and repair damage. So now let's move forward in time. 1960s, many of you know this story. Here you're seeing uh, Dr. Leonard Hayflick. Hayflick was an early pioneer in cell culture. He was developing cultured human somatic cells from the lung as a means of making vaccines. Billions of people are, by the way, uh, walking around with the products made from these cells. They actually came from an aborted human fetus. They're fetal fibroblasts. Uh, and billions of people have received vaccines uh, from the, these cells. Dr. Hayflick, in culturing these cells, had a problem. They would proliferate and then stop. And he was puzzled. He thought he had to be doing something wrong. And one of his colleagues one day in the lunchroom said, Len, maybe your cells are just growing old. And he developed that into what is today one of the leading models of laboratory models of biological aging. So the thought of many aging researchers are, if you want to understand human aging, use the fibroblast model. Uh, of course, some other people study fruit flies and yeast aging and different kinds of aging. The concern, of course, is whether that has anything to do with human aging. So here we have on the left, uh, young uh, WI38 fibroblasts. And then the, on the right, after a, a finite number of doublings, there's a clockwork mechanism at work. These cells stop dividing. Many researchers thought for years this is so complex, we'll never understand it. There were hundreds of changes that occur in aging cells in vitro. And the consensus in the, even the gerontology community was hopelessly complex, we'll never understand it, and certainly never been able to intervene in it. Well, as you can see here, in 1986, a researcher named Howard Cook was measuring telomere length, and he was interested in how it was changing. 
And he put this figure in a Cold Spring Harbor Symposium publication, and he said, you know what? If you look at the ends of the DNA strands, the telomere, they're constant in, with time. In, for instance, sperm cells, male reproductive germline cells. But if you look in tissues of the human body, if people of different ages, they're shortening with time. Now, there was a Russian theoretician, Alexei Lovnikov, who predicted that the telomere, which I'm illuminating here on the end of the chromosome strands, was actually a clocking mechanism behind the Hayflick phenomenon. Alovnikov's theory, called marginotomy at the time, now the telomere hypothesis, predicted that as the cells replicated, there was a defect in replicating the very terminal strands of the DNA molecule. And so the way we now measure telomere like commonly is to use restriction enzymes, you know, that digest DNA into little pieces. And then here you can see what is called a TRF, or a terminal restriction fragment, from the end of the DNA strand to where a restriction enzyme uh, cut it closest to the telomere. And so telomere, a TRF is telomere plus some subtelomeric sequences. So it's not a precise measure of telomere length, typically. But what was seen was uh, that as somatic cells aged, telomeres were indeed shortening. And so here on the right, you can see how we typically used to measure um, telomere length on a southern blot. And you can see the intensity as cells double, uh, the intensity uh, diminishing and the telomere length shortening. Or on the left here, a, a graph of how telomeres start at the beginning of life around TRF length, starts at around 15,000 kilobase pairs, shortens until you reach the Hayflick limit. Now, something funny can happen. If you hit the cells with oncogenic viruses that can turn a normal cell into a cancer cell, the cells continue to replicate beyond what they normally would to really short telomere lengths. This was one of the clues that attracted my attention because when you do that, there's a later onset senescence and telomeres are hooking together. You get what are called dicentrics. And that was a clue that the telomere could indeed be the clock. Uh, are there exceptions? Sure. Cancer cells somehow escape senescence and become immortal and immortalize. The famous HeLa cell line that you hear about, Henrietta Lacks uh, cervical cancer cell line, HeLa, uh, is an immortal cell. And so the telomere hypothesis predicted that telomerase an enzyme that's present in the reproductive lineage is absent in somatic cells, causing telomere shortening, causing Weissman to be right that somatic cells have a finite lifespan, and it's because of an absence of telomerase. But it, could it be that simple? Another uh, important clue was, as we were studying cell aging in the dish, it became clear that when cells uh, a rest in their replication and senescence, uh, they turn ugly. So here I'm showing on the top, uh, on the left, a, a normal cell in its resting state. If you wound a tissue, cells become activated, and you can see they make, for instance, increased levels of MMP1, that's collagenase, uh, that, for instance, dissolves a tadpole tail uh, and makes it resorb. And, uh, and so it re we remodel tissue, and then cells go back and rest again in the quiescent state. But senescent cells are rested not in a quiescent state, but in an activated state. You know, sort of like a car with the accelerator and the brake both down at a traffic light. And the result is senescent cells can cause a lot of tissue damage uh, if they would accumulate in tissue. So here what I've just laid out for you is sort of a time bomb of aging a clocking mechanism linked to destructive activity, elevated metalloproteinases and things that can destroy tissues, thin the skin, such as you saw there in the progeric patient, and so on. Uh, could it be that simple? Well, one of the tests was, could we transfer telomerase from the germline into somatic cells and find out? That was what the major goal uh, we, of, in the early days of Geron. 
So we had to find the molecular components of telomerase to test the causality of this whole mechanism. In this diagram, you can see coming in the telomeric strand and then the finger and thumb modality of the catalytic component of telomerase that actually makes the telomeric repeat. So it's actually extending out the fuse, so to speak. And then it carries, it's a very unusual enzyme, it carries with it an RNA template that allows it to make the TTA, GGG repeat on the ends of the telomere. We cloned the RNA piece and saw that it was expressed both in the germline and somatic cells. But when we cloned the catalytic component and looked in mortal cells and immortal cells, bingo, it was not present in somatic cells. And so the, we got to have the fun of dropping this gene into somatic cells, one gene, to see if it would immortalize cells. Uh, as Bernie was saying, uh, there's a fun story behind this. Len Hayflick's skin cells from his leg were the first cells ever to be transfected with telomerase. And as many of you know, this gene can immortalize cells without transforming them into cancer. So what this led to in the mid-90s was an interest in, well, how do we use this technology and could we capture the germline in the dish? Because we would predict that the cells would be naturally telomerase positive and this could open the door to what we've been talking about this conference, the regenerative medicine. So if we look at how development proceeds, it recapitulates evolution. It's called ontogeny reach capitulates phylogeny. And the thought was that very early in human development, the cluster of cells that forms from the fertilized egg are sort of like that vulvox I showed you before. And the cluster of cells inside were, that were the immortal germline lineage are shown here is the inner cell mass of a blastocyst embryo. If we could culture the inner cell mass of a human a blastocyst, we will have captured the human germline. And the magic that Bernie referred to is when I was meeting with Jamie Thompson, I realized Jamie had filed a patent on primate, human embryo, uh, primate embryonic stem cells. It potentially could extend to human, and you would have a patent on the human germline. These cells are capable, uh, we, all of the cells in the human body have no dead ancestors, right? Uh, we're a continuation of a lineage of cells that go back to the dawn of life on Earth, despite what people say about entropy and wear and tear. But going forward, our cells normally don't have that potential, but these do. The cells you're, you're seeing here have the potential to make humans for the indefinite future. They are the human germline in the dish. Now, what most people picked up on was right off where these were the master cell, stem cells of the human body. They're, they're capable of branching off into all the cell types of the human body. And, you know, it's just amazing that up to this point, you know, we can repair a car and keep an antique car going, make manufacture parts. We've never had a manufacturing modality for the cellular components of the human body. It's an amazing omission. But now we had a, an immortal a uh, master cell bank of human embryonic stem cells that can proliferate indefinitely and be, then be used for the directed differentiation to make young cells of all kinds, neuronal cells, which is a lot of talk about RPE cells, heart muscle cells, but you know, this list of cell types in the clinic being developed will continue uh, for you know, many decades to come. 1997, this is when Bernie <laughs> entered the field, the cloning of Dolly the sheep. I, you see another example of what people thought was physically impossible being quite simple. Who would have thought that you could find the clockwork of cell aging and one gene would stop cell aging? Who would have thought that a somatic cell, when transplanted back into an egg cell, could reprogram itself and make a whole new animal. Um, Keith Campbell uh, used to tell me, who cloned Dolly, said everyone thought I was bonkers. You know, no one believed this would work. But it does work. So somatic cells, when transplanted into egg cell, uh, can 
programmed cells back into uh, pluripotent stem cells. This technique, of course, is really laborious and technically challenging. It typically takes weeks to months to train people to do this. Yeah, it looks easy on a video with a trained technician, but you remove the chromosomes from, from an oocyte. Here is a, actually an aged somatic cell, a cell at the end of its replicative lifespan, an entire cell called nuclear transfer. It's really cell transfer. Put into the... Um, intervitellin space and then uh, uh, given a little electric shock to fuse the membranes and trick the oocyte into thinking that was a sperm cell that fertilized it. Then if you turn it back and do, in this case, a, a, a bovine clone, a cow clone, you can see here in, in this figure from a published paper, the normal replicative lifespan of the cells. If we took the cells at senescence and transferred them back into an egg cell, we restore and indeed beyond the original lifespan of the cell, we rewind the clock back to the beginning of life. Amazing, but true. But of course, the implications for human medicine are staggering. What that means is this immortal lineage of cells that can keep making humans generation after generation could be used to make new and young heart muscle or new or young neurons for you and me forever and ever. Nuclear transfer is a challenging technology. Who would have thought that we could reduce this down to just a few genes? I remember um, a discussion with Mark Tashney back in the days of nuclear transfer. And uh, we had a few glasses of wine. And I asked Mark, um, Mark, it's probably transcription factors. How many, you think? And he took a long sip of wine and said, four. Who would have thought? So now defined molecular components and induced pluripotency can take a cell back. And here, as you can see, effectively reset telomere length and, of course, restore pluripotency to the cells. And reset cell lifespan back. It's not just telomere length. Now, of course, what this opens up are all kinds of opportunities. One of the most difficult, I think, to fully envision is the profound synergy and mixing now of this revolution and next generation sequencing with cell biology. If we kind of put all the cards on the table, I'll put them all on the table. The top left are my skin cells. And then the top, in the middle top there are my pluripotent stem cells. Those could become a, a baby Michael West. And on the right is, confidentially, my genome. What does all this mean? It means we can go into uh, an immortal substrate, like my iPS cells, and engineer anything. Because the cells will replicate indefinitely, we can expand genetically modified clones of cells indefinitely. I can make my cells engineered in any way imaginable and make cells of any kind. And so the possibilities really extend beyond any imagination of any person that I know on the planet. But put simply, in the context of aging, it means that whether using off-the-shelf pluripotent stem cells or personalized reprogrammed cells, we can make, uh, as I said, genetically modified or just normal cells of all types that are young, are the cells that we had that we were when, when we were born. Now, some of the products that are in the clinic right now are you know, first-generation products, RPE cells. Why are people so excited about RPE? In the back of the retina, you can see here this layer of retinal pigment epithelium. It's a really critical cell type in, in maintaining the, the retina. It repels the vascular bed on one side and nourishes the neural retina on the other. All, retina, all animal retinas that have a neural retina have RPE. They're critical cell types. We've never published this, but RPE age, they lose telomere length. And then with age, you see these patches where there are senescent or a complete lack of RPE, and you get the invasion of the retina by vascular 
uh, neovascularization, which is the wet form of macular degeneration, or the dry form, which is 90% of the disease, for which there's currently no therapy. A massive problem, hugely debilitating, easy to make, solid mechanism of action, a low dose of cells required, a relatively immunoprivileged site. You know, it's, well, it's the hallmarks of a low-hanging fruit on that tree of human cellular development. The cells can be injected in solution, as you see here on the left, uh, and can then reform the simple monolayer in the back of the eye. So it's really an, a, an ideal clinical indication. These cells are being developed uh, by a subsidiary uh, called uh, Cell Care Neurosciences in Israel. Another application uh, we've heard uh, about worldwide, really. Uh, we heard just in the previous talk about Japan, but it's the worldwide problem is obesity and associated type 2 diabetes and hypertension and coronary disease, the whole metabolic syndrome. Everyone knows about we need to lose weight. The problem is we don't do it. I mean, it's a joke, right? I mean, every New Year's Eve, it's a resolution we don't do it. It's a massive problem. What we've learned in the last few years is there's hope of a new kind. We know about fat, white fat, white adipose tissue, WAT. Uh, so you eat a lot, you store it up. Um, what's been a puzzle for years is why the redistribution of fat? Why do we gain it at, in, as visceral fat, abdominal fat? Why does it build up around the coronaries? Well, now we've learned about another kind of fat called brown adipose tissue, or brown fat. It's a, it does the opposite of normal fat. It burns calories. It sops up glucose like crazy out of the blood, metabolizes triglycerides. It's a furnace that normally balances metabolism. The problem is, look at this on the left. That's the amount of brown fat in individuals as they age, a precipitous loss. When you're born, you have a lot of it behind your shoulder blades. Um, my son is a teenager, you know, he eats a quart of ice cream every night. He would never gain a pound, he'd gain a gallon a night. I would. Uh, with that loss of brown fat, then, you throw off that balance, and uh, fat can accumulate in the wrong place, especially, not just subcutaneously, but around the coronaries, visceral fat, as I mentioned, and it leads to this whole imbalance we call metabolic syndrome. The exciting news is the transplantation of brown fat into obese diabetic rodents can reverse the symptoms of diabetes. It can make animals insulin sensitive again, they can lose weight, and the dream come true is without exercise, without cutting back on the diet, because you restored this balance of the metabolism. You can make these cells from pluripotent stem cells. Look on the left is uh, a fetal-derived brown fat. I'm standing here for UCP1, a marker brown fat. You can see the cells, but they're not homogeneous. What we need for clinical use is homogeneous, scalable, defined, potent brown fat progenitors, and you can do that uh, using uh, a technology we call pure stem. This is a really big opportunity in aging. It's just one example of what we can do in aging, but it's estimated one out of three Americans are going to have diabetes, most of it, of course, 90% being type two uh, by 2050. It's a huge expenditure in the United States, over about $250 billion in annual costs, a uh, lot of direct medical costs associated with it, and a huge amount of reduced productivity, like a lot of these age-related diseases. A problem near and dear to me is my father died of a heart attack, and it always bothered me, why can't we rebuild the vasculature of the human body? During development, embryonic vasculature reaches out to ischemic tissues and vascularizes them robustly. It builds the tree, the vascular tree. You can make embryonic vascular endothelium with 100% purity as well, using clonal expansion of progenitors. Uh, vascular diseases being similarly, well, a trillion dollar market worldwide.
Now I want to talk last part of my talk about, I've talked about several revolutions here of thought. Finding the mechanism of cell aging, isolation of the human germline, um, the application of that technology and actually making products that enter clinical trials, reprogramming. There's a new revolution breaking, and it's a skunkworks project, really. It's a stealth project. It's not being discussed widely, but there's some groups working on this around the world. And we believe this is the biggest uh, revolution ever. We call it induced tissue regeneration. What is it? Well, I begin with a quote from a researcher that many of us know in the aging field, uh, George Williams, who worked on the evolution of aging. And he made, again, this prescient observation that seems so obvious, but hidden within it is a clue to some very profound biology. He said, it's indeed remarkable that after a seemingly miraculous feat of morphogenesis, really is, isn't it? The human body is built up out of nothing, de novo, and is alive the whole time. <laughs> Can you imagine assembling a jet airline from components and it flies the whole time? <laughs> Every component can fly, it's just amazing. But that it cannot perform the much simpler task of simply maintaining that which it's already formed. Why? On the left, you can see the development of a building. It's like embryonic development. You construct it out of nothing. And then we have a functional building, and then you maintain that building. But in aging, you see this destruction. It can't maintain that which it's already built. Why? Is it possible we could in institute into the developed human the regenerative potential that originally led to the, to the um, developing human? And that's the key to ITR. Why do we think this is possible? I was talking to Arnie Kaplan. Isn't that you out there, Arnie? He was, we were talking about this earlier, and he said he quizzed people uh, in his classrooms I lobbed off my finger. How many of you think that medicine will ever be able to make it regrow? And he said, no one raised their hand or something. Who would think? Well, we should think so, because if you look on the scale of life I'm showing you here, simple organisms can regenerate. The planaria near the bottom of the list is immortal under the edge of the knife. You can cut off its head, it'll regrow a new head, and it'll do that forever. It doesn't have any limit to the amount of, rep of regeneration it can do. Other animals, then tend, more advanced animals, tend to show it, but only at the embryonic stages of development. Uh, the Mexican salamander, the third on the list, is a well-known example of a profoundly regenerative vertebrate. If you go way up to human, it's also well-known that we have regenerative potential early in development. It makes sense. You're forming the body. Why not form it again? Uh, but in up to eight weeks of human development, while the human being and all this development and organogenesis is occurring, if you cut the skin, it heals back in about 72 hours completely and scarlessly. Once you enter fetal development, and development's pretty much complete, you start seeing the scarring response as a reflection that the body can't do that anymore. What's changed? That's the, that's the question. Another clue comes, let's look at the Mexican salamander. At the top you see the animal in the larval state. It's like the polywog state. Most such amphibians would go into an adult metamorph on the bottom left, uh, an adult amphibian. Uh, on the, but the Mexican salamander is different. It has what's called a heterochronous uh, state it is arrested in an embryonic or larval state as an adult. And it's thought that it's missing some signaling from the thyroid hormone axis. So it, it does not mature into uh, to full maturity, but spends out its whole li adult life as a larval, in a larval state. And what it can do then is this profound regeneration. And this is really amazing. I remember a medical student, I, 
talked to once, and I said, you know, what is the most, if you're doing gross anatomy, what's the most amazing part of the anatomy? And I was thinking the brain, you know. He says, now the arm. It's just so amazing. It's so complex. It's so intricate. You can lob off the an these animals at the elbow, and they regrow it from the elbow. And lob it off at the wrist, they regrow at the wrist. How does nature do this? It has to be. All of you guys are scientists. It has to be that it's repeating development. What are the molecular switches that are turned off as the animal goes from the larval state to the adult state, or in the case of humans, from the embryonic to the fetal state? If we could understand that, hidden within our own cells could be the potential of a profound scarless regeneration unforeseen previously in medicine. How would we get at that? So what we did is we cloned out. We took a single cell from this developing tree that we calculated was still in the embryonic as opposed to fetal stages of development, starting with pluripotent stem cells. We called this pure stem for lack of a better designation. And then we collaborated with a, uh, a group called In Silico Medicine, who's using advanced artificial intelligence algorithms, deep learning. So these are computer algorithms that you may have heard that can learn, for instance, uh, image recognition, face recognition. You can train these computers to do very complex analysis, recognize a Renoir. Some of you have used these apps on your phone. And you can take a picture of your choice, and it'll paint it as a Renoir, as a Renoir would have painted it. Um, these, this recognition of complex patterns can be applied to microarray data from thousands of different human embryonic progenitors that still have this regenerative potential. And you can compare them then to adult-derived cells and ask, how do these mechanisms work? They might not be that complex. Now, I'm showing you, um, this is a s s stealth project, so I'm not showing you all the things here today. But I'm showing you uh, one marker to show you how interesting this biology is. So this COX-7A1 is a component of the respiratory chain in mitochondria. And um, we know, we've known for years that this changes in embryology. So you're more glycolytic when you're an embryo and uh, oxidative when you're an adult. And in cancer, it's the Warburg effect. You go back to the state. We've known about this. The biology has never really been unearthed. So on the left, you can see mesenchymal stem cells, neural stem cells, all kinds of adult and fetal-derived cells. They all are telling us they've passed the embryonic fetal transition. They've lost that profound regenerative capacity. Look at the diverse clonal embryonic progenitors. They're still embryonic, all of them. If you look on the bottom right, you can actually see, we've traced out during human development how this, when this gene is turning on, and it's, co it's coincident with the onset of scarring and loss of regenerative potential in humans. And then on the far right, you can see that it's effectively reset by transcriptional reprogramming. Here's an example of how this plays out. So um, this gene, again, an adult marker, you can see in MSCs and then differentiated MSCs, and then in some uh, chondrogenic and osteogenic uh, embryonic progenitors, you can see that they do not turn this gene on. But on the right there, you can see they profoundly turn on collagen 2 and make cartilage. Um, is, we think this is the reason why if you induce trauma into a bone and inject these cells uh, into uh, a damaged bone like you see here, they can recognize and become bone where they should become bone and cartilage where they should become that tissue. Where I believe this field's headed is that we're going to be able to combine this technology with telomerase to make humans sort of like planaria, immortal under the edge of the knife. An ability to regenerate tissues indefinitely uh, using these mechanisms. We call it ITR, induced tissue regeneration. To sort of define it, it's the induction of the ability to recapitulate embryogenesis 
in the tissues of an adult mammal by means of the administration of exogenous reprogramming factors either in vitro or in vivo. So what we're beginning to learn about aging is telomerase turns off very early, um, maybe as early as two weeks in a lot of tissues. We start to age in the womb, as some people have said. This is playing an important role in aging, certainly in the hematopoietic system, uh, but also there's this uh, switch, probably like telomerase, being turned off because it's a tumor suppression mechanism to prevent tissue regeneration. Uh, it also is adventitious to prevent cancer, but the consequence is you can only scar, you cannot regenerate uh, tissues as profoundly as you would uh, with it on. Now, we've seen some demographics, but uh, we're really, it's really worth taking a couple minutes to, to refresh our memory on this. We're at this, look at this inflection point, 2016, we're right where this curve is really beginning to hit, uh, hit us. 80% of our two and a half trillion dollar healthcare expenditures in the US are due to these very diseases we've been talking about, chronic degenerative diseases where the body cannot heal itself. 92% of the elderly have one, 77% have two or more. And it's only going to get worse. Four of them have two thirds of our deaths in the United States. And many of them need cell regenerative approaches because drugs are increasingly demonstrably ineffective. The boomers are a big part of this, but then after this we have the echo boomers, and we're not gonna see any real relief from this demographic until uh, Generation Z grows old. So this is a long-standing problem for the United States. Uh, arthritis being perhaps the number one complaint of an aging population, a massive percentage of our population having uh, that requiring knee and hip replacement surgery, and a lot of pain. But you, you know the list. You know the drill. When I see this curve, I think of a tsunami. You know, uh, 76 million strong, adding a million to our nursing homes in the next couple decades, uh, sapping the strength of our GDP. David Walker, the ex-comptroller in the United States, uh, talks about the tens of trillions of dollars of unfunded obligations under Medicare. I wish that policymakers would look to science. When I grew up in the Sputnik era, everyone said, hey, you scientists, can you help out? Everyone seems to think that science and technology and biotechnology would just add to the problem. I point out to people, you know, smallpox vaccine, you know how much it costs us to have smallpox put in the bands? every year, zero. Medical innovation doesn't have, because it's gone, right? Because of science and technology. Science and technology doesn't necessarily mean increasingly expensive therapies. It could potentially reduce costs. And we know, I think we all know, how that could be accomplished. And we can do some remarkable things. This is a patient that uh, one of our centers uh, put online, uh, a subsidiary of ours of Asterius, continuing Geron's trial with OPC1 for the treatment of cervical complete spinal cord injury. This patient had, it was like Christopher Reeve, had a cervical complete spinal cord injury. He was on a respirator, had no sensation or motor function uh, from his neck down, and uh, is now texting his girlfriend and is, hopes to be married soon. And uh, really remarkable things can happen with a lot of determination and a lot of vision. There's been, it's been a long time getting here. Uh, I wanted to remind us that, you know, back when our nation was digesting how NIH should fund uh, pluripotent stem cell technologies, Harold Varmus, the Nobel laureate and ex-head of the NIH said that the development of cell lines that can produce any tissue of the human body is an unprecedented scientific breakthrough. It's not too unrealistic to say that this research has the potential to revolutionize the practice of medicine and improve the quality and length of life. You know, I'm a gerontologist. When I was in strawberry fields in New York City, I could have swore this said, I'm aging. Blink your eyes, look again. It says, imagine. That's how 
we see the world. I know I see the sea of humanity with the problems of aging, but this is near and dear to the heart of all of us. It's us, and it's our family members. It's our society. It's a major challenge for, as we heard, Japan, for the United States. And so I invite all of us, all of you, to imagine with me uh, you know, how we can turn these basic discoveries into therapies that will help all of us in the human condition. Thank you very much.